the Susquehanna River. This is a river that's 444 miles long. It's the largest river on the East Coast, and it started from upstate New York into the Chesapeake Bay. It was actually known in ancient times as the Indian Highway. Pennsylvania archaeologists have a way of establishing a timeline, and they delineated in Pennsylvania into five basic categories. It's Paleo-Indian, Archaic, Transitional, Woodland, and Contact Period. Let's talk first about the Paleo-Indian. The earliest evidence in Pennsylvania where man has been hunting mastodon is actually 16,000 BC. This primitive man were still nomadic and they were hunting big game animals. What they had are these long spears with a projectile point. The projectile point is called Clovis. This particular point is actually channeled or fluted. They were massive and they were meant to take down big game. Then they had an atlatl, which would actually help increase the distance of the throw because primitive man didn't want to get too close to their prey. So what they would do is they would try to increase their distance and take down the big animals. Next comes the Archaic period. That starts around 8,000 BC. Still, these primitive people were in nomadic small bands and they're still hunting and foraging for food. You might ask, well, what's the evidence that we had people back in those days? What did these ancient ones leave behind? Things such as hides and bones and grasses and wood, that decomposes very quickly in our acidic soils, especially here in Pennsylvania. So all they really did leave were the stone tools. The transitional period, which was 2000 to 1000 BC, here's where really big changes occurred. The actual blade on the spear itself became very long and very broad. They actually are called Susquehanna broad spears. Another big change in the transitional period came in the form of discovering soapstone. Soapstone is also known as steatite. What it is actually is a form of talc, and it's soft, it's able to be carved. So the ancient ones took this outcropping of this type of material, and they actually shaped cooking bowls so that they can actually cook over an open fire. The problem with stone tool technology, especially when the Native Americans were preparing their foods, there's a lot of grit that comes when grinding and preparing. What happens is a lot of these little bits of stone get into the food, and then when they were chewing, it would actually wear down their teeth, their enamel, and they would be exposed roots, therefore causing sepsis. The next period is the Woodland Period. That's 1000 BC to 1550 AD. Now picture these people are now beginning to settle down into small encampments, particularly around rivers and small streams. Their food source became a little bit more variety. It became increased because they started to become, ah, farmers. Here is where agriculture started to begin. So they had a variety that they were starting to actually grow some crops. The late woodland period saw a great change. This is when the bow and arrow technology came. No longer were they using the big broad spears. Now, the projectile point was now a small triangular shaped point, and it was made from various cherts in the area. The late woodland also brought pottery. Since these tribes were now living in small hamlets or even longhouses, pottery was now used to store grains. They were also used as a cooking vessel, and even there's decorated ceremonial vessels. The progression of pottery went from steatite stone bowls to a flat bottom pot to a round bottom pot, and eventually it was discarded altogether, and that's where the brass kettles took their place. The contact period is marked by trade interactions. This occurs from 1550 to 1750. A remarkable change occurred within the Native American societies when they came in contact with the Europeans. As you advance in time, a lot of the Native articles were replaced by European goods. In particular, the iron axes, the glass bottles and beads, colonial pipes, guns, and alcohol. The origins of the Susquehanna 
started in upstate New York. They had common roots with the Iroquois around 1450 AD. They started migrating south into the lower Susquehanna Valley. As they moved down the Susquehanna River, the first village they occupied was the Schultz site from 1525 to 1600. In fact, the Schultz site is directly across from the Blue Rock Heritage Center. Every 25 years, the Susquehannocks moved their village site. They moved either north or south, basically due to that they used up all the resources within a certain radius. In the village of Washington Borough, the warriors traveled down the Susquehanna River to meet Captain John Smith in 1608. They met on Garrett Island, which is at the head of the Chesapeake Bay, right around Port Deposit, Maryland. We do not really know what the Susquehannocks called themselves. In fact, Susquehannock was a descriptive term used by Captain John Smith's interpreter. And this interpreter was Algonquin. The French called the Susquehannocks the Andaste. The Dutch and the Swedes, well, they called them Minka. And it was a rather derogatory term. It actually means stealthy or treacherous. Ah, but we English called them the Conestoga. But for our purposes, we're going to call them the Susquehannocks. Most of us are familiar with the account between the 60 mighty Susquehanna warriors and Captain John Smith, where Smith describes the Susquehannock as giants. He said they have a big, deep voice actually coming like out of a vault. They wore skins of bears and wolves, and they were accompanied by large clubs and bows and arrows. We know that from history that Smith likes to exaggerate. He liked to sell the concept of colonization to the New World, but physical archeological evidence in the form of skeletons show the average Susquehanna male around 5.6 feet and the female around 5.2. Trade goods. Native Americans' desire for beads in the form for decorations for their jewelry were actually sewn onto their clothing or they wore them as necklaces. Trade goods also took the form of iron tools brass kettles. But the Europeans, what did they want in return? Well, they wanted beaver furs, because back in England, the beaver hats were all the rage. The Susquehanna women made their pots out of clay coils. They added crushed shells to give it strength, and they paddled the exterior to smooth out the coils and expel air bubbles. They used bone tools they inscribed intricate triangular lines, and they even formed human faces onto these high collars with rounded bottoms. Some forms of pottery even took on full figures demonstrating their artistic talents. Most of the highly decorated vessels were placed with their loved ones as grave offerings, or they were used as ceremonial vessels, which were to be in a prominent place in the longhouse. Smith complimented the Washington Borough women potters, and he actually said they were the finest potters comparable to the men who were potters back in England. The Susquehannocks, they actually occupied villages on both sides of the river. But by 1690 to 1763, they ended up in Conestoga Town, Lancaster County. By this time, the Susquehannocks converted to Christianity. They were in decline both culturally and economically. They actually try to sustain themselves as farm workers, domestics, or they even succumb to selling handmade crafts such as brooms and baskets. 1763, a vigilante group called the Paxton Boys was formed to retaliate against local American Indians in the aftermath of the French and Indian War on December 15th Activists blamed the Conestoga for helping the enemy and killing settlers. They actually found and killed three men, two women, and one boy. Officials in Lancaster, wishing to protect the remaining innocent Indians, gathered them into the county workhouse. But on September 27th, the Paxton boys stormed the Lancaster jail and murdered at least 20 Native Americans, mostly women, children, and old men. The authorities looked the other way, and no one was ever prosecuted for this violent act. <laughs>